Well, hey there, team, and welcome back to the channel, and welcome back to some more Starbase. Oh, I'm still obsessed with this game. Look at these cars. Very cool. Oh, wow, what's this bloke been up to? Let's have a look. Okay. He's just tacked on more things and more engines at the back by the look of it. I wonder how it goes with a full load. That looks really cool, doesn't it? Oh, he's got a turret on the back. Oh, man. It's a utility. Looks like something out of... You know? Blood Diamond or something. Or maybe more like District 9. Okay, so... Where are we at? Where are we at? Well, uh, previously we had a... We, we uh, showcased the, the Gronk 962 TAC 3 Bravo, right? That was the, uh, that was my little sort of square, my first, uh, first run, my first prototype, my little square, my little baby, right? Um, loading price. No, I think, didn't it say current station? Huh. There it is there. All right. Turn on my headlamp. It's not bad, not bad first sort of proof of concept, just getting all the systems working, all the w wiring, programming, that sort of thing. She goes all right, but ultimately it's only really got four cubes in it, you know, and that was an afterthought. And for those that missed it, you know, Scarlet Squareheads and Gronk and all this weird channel fiction that we've got, basically cubes. It's only going to be cubes. It is the one most important tenet of building in this game. Okay, cool. So that's pretty compact, right? That's pretty small. And then, to, then I'll show you the bloody, uh, the Esche, the SS Esche. Oh, that's interesting. That, oh, it despawns the Gronk on its own. That's cool. Hmm. I should have driven that out, actually, so I could compare the size. So this thing's roughly a quarter of the size. Well, I mean, you're talking three in three dimensions as well, but look at this thing. What an absolute little bloody Chad machine, right? So, you can see everything's crammed into my cube there. We've got the maneuvering and the, it's basically as big as a seat. And it bloody goes too, right? Well, I mean, if you've got the fuel plugged in, which we probably don't. We've probably got a dead fuel cell, to be perfectly honest, because I haven't really been putting off buttons on these things. So, uh, that's been a bit of a task. So hang on, I'm getting better at this, at the, uh, the manual handling. I can't tell, is this a... Hey, perfect. And uh, from what people have told me as well, you actually kind of need to bolt it in as well. Uh, nine. So let's, uh... oh shit. <laughs> oh, oh, quick, quick, get to the car. This <laughs> Hang on, can I get the seat? Okay, I can turn the throttle off. <laughs> oh man, battery's charging slowly. Okay, so she... Again, like I said, these are little prototypes. I couldn't give a shit if I flew them into the sun, to be honest. But, um... But this thing bloody goes, right? She's not here to mess around. She's got some serious maneuverability. I've had to really nerf a lot of it. Interestingly, though, see there, the, uh, the pitch... That's okay. So the ro the, the, the yaw is cool and the roll is cool, and they're at, like, 25%, right? But, um, but we have some pitch problems, and that's ultimately because I've only been able to fit one there and one there, right? So just nature of the design, having some difficulties fitting more things in, it actually makes a huge difference not having, uh, like enough maneuvering thrusters, right? Oh, look at these dudes. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty proud of this little thing, and to be perfectly honest, you could probably... I can't see why you couldn't just sit... Can you sit in the pilot seat with a machine gun? Like, I suppose... I can't take tools out while I'm sitting here, right? Like... What's this bloke doing? You flirting with me, sir. <laughs> oh! 
Oops. <laughs> oh man, it's funny playing. With, I like this game, interacting with the community. A lot of flexing going on, you know. But yeah, I'm pretty happy with this cube. It's cool. It was cool, a cool experiment to miniature. Yeah, see, it really needs more of that. Oh, we can despawn here. Nice. So let's just put that away. Okay, cool. So that's that's sort of what I was up to. It's actually been a while since I've touched that cube. A lot's happened since then. We did a few streams you can probably find on the channel. I did like a 10 hour one because I'm a fucking nut job. I don't know. But um, oh, look at that one jetting past. He's going for it. Oh, he's going for it. Um, so let me show you, what I'll do is I'll show you some of my current designs that I'm sort of working on at the moment. Give you, maybe give you some inspiration, give you an idea. I'm not pur purporting to be an expert, but I've gotten to a point where I can pretty much wire, I can get a ship together, right? The, the, the thing that limits me now is my creative spirit. I'm going down the rabbit hole learning YOLO as well, which is the, uh, in-game, uh, editing tool uh, no in-game um, coding tool right which is actually incredibly simple when you compare it to other codes however I'm still getting a grasp around it um, but if you've ever written any sort of programming language at all it's a walk in the park you'll pick it up easy peasy um, and then we'll go out and uh, harvest some asteroids because I've got another square that I've made so first things first Let's open up the new two. No, it'll be the new square. We'll open the new square. This is sort of functional. I've built one already. I have one in my garage. And this was the the product of me going, all right, let's let's make actually I'll wait till it's built in so you can, I can show you the concept, right? And the idea is, okay, it's gotta be a cube because I'm an idiot, right? And so it is. Um, and I figured to myself, what would be the most sensible way to to actually do this and then potentially iterate upon it and add cargo as we go? Because, um, let me slow down. I'm, I'm, be I'm sort of tripping over myself here. This thing has one thruster, right? It has like one drivetrain, one source of go. It's got maneuvering thrusters, but ultimately it's, it's propulsion is one. I know, okay, that seems like a pretty basic statement. But the thing is, if you bring up your stability tools, um, you click on like here, right? That's all good and well. A lot of people understand the warp class stability. And you can go to these little, uh, well, they're warnings. They're not really straight out errors, but they'll tell you, hey, you could probably put some more bolts in this or whatever you can say. But as long as it's green, you're pretty good. And warp class two is not terrible. It's not like we're pulling huge G-forces or anything. What you can do though with this tool is right click and it brings up all of this, which is stresses. And it's really, really interesting. Um, you can see that they get a specific color if they have a point of propulsion attached to them because there will be a thruster there, right? And you can see the hard points where this is attached that'll be coming through. One other thing that you might realize, which wasn't immediately obvious, is that the size and dimension of the beams actually matters in this mode. So to sort of elaborate on that, if you have a look, uh, maybe look at some of my beams along here, right? You can see if we bring out the select tool, it is a construct of multiple different length beams because we can't always get the perfect right one, right? And that's all good and well because then you use the weld tool and from the green uh, warp class uh, perspective, it doesn't care. As long as it's welded together, your right is rain, your warp class is fine. But then when you go into this tool, and it's going to be harder to see because I've actually distributed the weight really well, not to, you know, humble flex. But the way that it actually interacts between each beam, now you can't really see it there. But it does actually take into factor if one of your be here you go perfect example this is an absolute textbook example right let's select tool we've got this tiny little bit here and we've got that longer bit there right now this is still a point of propulsion but it is messing like less the the, the purple block color but more look at the vert the uh, vectors that are going on here right it's going to the center of uh well mass I suppose the the center of the object out and it's drawing different 
vectors which affects the other ones as well, right? And you can potentially compact your stress by accident or intentionally. So what would be the fix here? Well, I actually, it's interesting that I've caught that because I think we're going to see it's a big problem. But that's my sort of point. This is a, a bit more nuanced that I think I haven't seen anyone really talk about that a lot of people don't realize. And that's why I've been building it this way. I've been like, okay, let's create a drivetrain that is centerline symmetrical. In fact, it's as, it's as symmetric as I possibly could make it also in the Y axis, but at least in two axes, it's symmetric, right? Across and deep. And then we make it as short as I physically can while having all the core components along there. So we've made this center sort of barrel that dictates the shape and dimensions of my cube because I'm taking the cube thing quite seriously. This is the shortest I could make it and most compact while keeping it uh, symmetric along the center line, right? Because I don't want to turn the engine sideways or anything like that. I want it all centered so that my center of thrust and center of mass is as, as uniform as possible. And then that helps me know how tall and how wide the cube should be. So there's a lot of method to this madness. And then, once you've done that, we had the frame, you can start adding boxes in as symmetrically as possible to distribute your weight. Now, one thing that people might not be across is this virtual mass. And this is how people, people that we looked at that ship earlier, that just keep adding boxes and boxes and engines and engines, but they don't modify their frame or anything like that. And they're going to blow their ship up and they don't know why. It's because of the mass of the boxes when they're full. So if we go add maximum mass and go apply to all, right? And then we go back into the uh, tool here. For starters, our warp class has come down. Now, like I said, this is a pretty sturdy frame. I've considered it from day dot. So that so it's gone down from, what was it? 2.02 .02 to 1.8 with all these boxes full. So that's not terrible, but you can have a look here. If I say I remove the mass, apply to all. Look at that. Look at the difference of the strain. Now, it's not a huge amount of strain anyway. The, the hot pink one's not terrible. Uh, apply to all. But you can see it coming in. And you can also see, you can drift around in that as well, but you start to get... Look at them. The shape of my vectors is different. And you can already see, I'm sitting, I'm sitting center right now. And we'll put the mouse center. But you can see it there, right? It fades much more out to here and it's way hotter in here, right? Which is interesting, right? Because that has longer segments. So who knows? It's gonna take a bit more trial and error to know, like maybe I should be building the whole ship out of tiny little girder segments or long. You'd assume that longer contiguous frames would make more sense. You know, like a, a 200 centimeter bar versus a 20 centimeter bar or 24 centimeter bar. But um, who's to say for sure? Um, I've also found that experimenting with these angled uh, girders, well, they, they look stupid, right? And in the real world, when I say stupid from like a, a distribution of mass, you look at that and you're like, how much is that really going to help? Because what you're probably used to seeing in, in proper construction, and you can actually see it out there in these models, you know, just hard diagonal point to point to transfer mass as efficiently as possible. You wouldn't think this would do it, and yet, the way it manifests in the game is ultimately as exactly that, as a triangle, right? Um, and it does so well. Um, let me try and turn. If I were to delete that, in fact, I can't see why we couldn't. Let's select it. And then we'll go back to the durability tool. And if I go delete, look at this. It actually generates a lot of stresses. And if we undo it, huge relief. So working with those pieces is incredibly helpful. Um, so it's cool. Like, so just a few tidbits that I've picked up along the way that I haven't seen a lot of people use. Like I said, I've, I've got an engineering background. I, that was my previous career, that sort of thing. Uh, I don't bang the drum about it because if I was a really good engineer, I'd, you know, I wouldn't be a fucking YouTuber, would I? But like, I'm competent enough to understand these systems and these, these are legit, man. These are really good. They're obviously within their own sort of twisted Newtonian world because 
there is a max speed, 150 meters per second. You know, this sort of, it's not really drag per se, but there is this inferred resistance, this weird relationship between thrust and weight. But I think I've illustrated how it works with each other quite well. I couldn't give you the rule book and the formulas on how it all works exactly. But the important thing to note is get friendly with not just the green warp class tool, but this as well. And get an idea of where your distributions are where your strain is, you know, because we're getting a lot of strain across there. This makes sense though, because the center line, I don't really have that joined in. Maybe I could to distribute it a little bit better, but um, but yeah, that should uh, give you a bit of an idea. So that's the first sort of thing. Also probably worth note, and you can look it up on the stream. None of these boxes are wired in. They actually require piping and cabling. And, uh, and I don't have a resource port on this, yet the version that I printed and bought, I do. I managed to do it all by hand, the equivalent of pulling out a, a bloody bolt tool and a cable tool, and I cabled it all in real time. I actually figured out, if you're curious as well, say you wanted to, uh, I mean, see like see how i select this module and i'm not i'm not in easy build mode or anything like that i know i'm in test mode at the moment i wonder though can i in fact do it i can't but that's how you would do it in the sort of real world uh, let's let's jump out actually let's jump out of it this took me a while to figure out but if you did want to in fact oh i don't know weld this girder on right See how I can't pull it out because I don't have a workbench or anything like that? What you want to do is drag it into the... Oh, hang on. Why is that not working? This I could work with. Hmm. Oh, you know what? It might have been from inventory. So you drag the girder out of your inventory like that. Oh, shit. And we crash the game. Oh, that's... Uh, not good. <laughs> but that's what I found works. Let's uh, let's reboot it. Oh my god, we got error reports and all sorts of things. It's still a, it's still got its issues, team. You know, I'm not going to pretend it doesn't. Um, sorry, I'll just boot this up as quick as I possibly can while it stops running. But yeah, I found that that's how you could like bolt all. You could you could build an entire ship from bloody scratch, but you would need to be dragging each part out of your inventory like that. It's very fiddly. Um, but in the end, that's how I ended up adding hard points and all that sort of stuff to my existing frame. Was doing uh, exactly that. All right, we should be coming back in now. I mean, I'm yep. There we go. OBS has picked it up. That's cool. All right, so that gives you a bit of an idea now current project that I'm sort of working on um well we're, we're still expending on that system because it's it is kind of modular right so if we go to new two which is where we're sort of up to on that I've actually added some boxes you know I've continued to iterate upon it um I've added thrusters and we're running into problems now as well because the network you can see I've added these corner thrusters it's gonna give us a lot more oomph but it would seem, and I'm still in the process of troubleshooting, and we've added a fuckload more crates. Um, the engine needs, uh, I probably need to put uh, either an extra generator, which would be this small square in there, or I might need an, a fuel rod converter, a second one altogether. So we might end up actually overhauling this center frame and you know, we'll put in a side-by-side -side sort of scenario there. Because as it stands, we're not generating enough uh, power across the network, I believe, to even start these engines. It's all a bit strange. I'd be curious if anyone else knows their way around this. I, I would take feedback. But the batteries will still charge, and yet these will not fire. And it's not because I haven't got them rigged in or coded correctly, because I, I do, right? I know for a fact I do. And they are receiving a signal flickeringly, and it almost feels like a you know, a breaker going out when you run too much power through a line. It feels like that sort of behavior in a strange way. So we'll get to the bottom of that. But yeah, you can see that we're basically just slow and steady iterating upon it. Add that virtual weight. Um, add max mass, apply to all. And look, yes, yeah, step we're starting to get some, some serious bloody stresses and strain going on there. And we've got to keep that warp class up. But you know, as it goes, we're adding quite a few boxes. And the point is that we will get to a point where 
maybe not for the single thruster because I've opted to add more thrusters because it, it got was getting quite slow. But we should be getting close to a good ratio between the thrust that we're generating and the weight that we can carry. So what might end up happening is I fill up all the spare space here with boxes and these five thrusters is more than enough to carry that, at which case we then expand the size of the frame to get more boxes in. So my point is that I'm really trying to find that sweet spot where the bottlenecking doesn't really exist, you know, at least not from a, you have too much weight and need more thrust, or you have overkill thrust and you could take more weight. I kind of want to get equilibrium there um, because there, there is an equilibrium sweet spot and we want to approach that. Uh, as opposed to just slapping the thing together willy-nilly. Anyway, so what started out as a meme making these fucking giant death cubes has actually turned into a, a fairly well-considered system. Okay, so bear with me. I'm going to show you my current new project that I'm working on. And this is very experimental. It still has some flaws. It's very prototype stage. But like I said, it'll give you an idea of what this game, what's beautiful about this game and how it can encourage you to sort of come up with interesting, cool ideas. Don't worry about this too much just yet. What we're looking at is here, right? This is a very basic layout of where we're going with it. You can see we've got some thrusters, right? We've got an ore collector back here, and we've got a seat precariously placed up in the top. What this is planning to be is a sort of... Um, asteroid collector device. I was talking about bottlenecks earlier, right? Um, in fact, I was talking as early as the first or second video that I put up. It's all about eliminating bottlenecks. Now, for example, we know that you can go at max speed 150 meters per second. So maybe you create a scenario where you have a fuckload of thrusters on your mining hauler, right? And then when it's at full virtual mass, it still travels at 150 meters per second, right? So now you're reducing your driving out time and you're reducing your return flight time, which means that you can go out longer, you know, and that's a bottleneck that we're dealing with there. Another one is getting more boxes on so you can stay out in the asteroid field longer, take in a larger haul. Maybe you are a bit slower, but overall, over the course of a couple of trips, you, the equivalency works out that maybe you're, you're earning more ore per second in a way, right? There's another consideration, which is, you know, mining lasers, which is what we're thinking about here. That's what this is. So when you go out there, you get your pickaxe, you belt it, you fly back to your little ship, you suck it in, but you should be able to narrow down on that. Now, one thing you could do is just add a mining laser, right? Probably stick it in the center. You don't have to get out of your seat. And then you have an ore collector, which does exactly what the auto collect does, but your ship does it instead. It'll suck in the ore automatically. So you can just drive up to the asteroid zap it, suck it in. That would be probably the clever next step. But what I'm sort of thinking about is something else altogether. Because let's say, hypothetically, um, let's say we hollow out the center of the box of the cube, because it's always going to be a cube, and we bring an asteroid into our hull, secure it, have a system that harvests it while we fly to the next asteroid. So that's a bottleneck. That's what this project is. That's the sort of bottlenecking that I'm moving on to now, right? The idea of taking on an asteroid, locking it down, cutting it up while I'm driving still and having a system that automates it. Um, so what we've got here is essentially, to give you an idea, you know, this is our open frame. You know, this it's going to be a cube like this, right? But very hollow in the center. At the front, we have a turntable. I haven't aligned that properly. I, I have done one over here that I've been testing on. But essentially, we've got a turret swivel, and we're going to have a rotating system here, this thing here. Now, I don't know if I can have something perpetually rotate. I'm having a hard time programming it. It feels like I might be able to only just turn it left and right of field 180 degrees, in which case that kind of wrecks this project. But we're still, you know, let's just go with it for the moment. Also, I don't know how torque forces um, work as well. This frame we could tighten up and we could put like a circular frame to turn it into a closed stable frame. And I have tested actual motion over here with a frame piece that's not attached to your 
central frame. You can see there that it actually does in fact move, right? So we, we can make frames that uh, move independent of the propulsion frame, but I'm just curious what happens if I get this thing spinning perpetually with code, is that gonna create a twisting torque on my ship or is it gonna sort of free spin because I don't know if friction exists in this game. So presumably the relationship between this turret would be like a zero exchange. So I'm, I'm, I, I don't know where it's going to go. And I can see a scenario where we could be driving along and this thing could be spinning clockwise a fucking million miles an hour the whole time. And it's not going to affect my flight path at all. I, I actually think that the game system might allow for that if I can code it. So we'll see. So anyway, we have this big bloody propeller turning um the idea is that we have an asteroid in the center all right which we can simply i don't know say we have our pilot's chair here sort of see the bounds of the frame this whole top of the frame is open we can fly up you see an asteroid coming in we go underneath it and then i can use maneuver thrusters to just go straight up and bring the asteroid into the center it wouldn't be hard at all you know, I'd have to use an advanced flight computer so that I have up and down control. I haven't been doing that with my cubes previously. But as far as getting an asteroid inside our open plan frame, that'd be easy. We essentially have an open top or an open bottom. So we go and locate the asteroid and we maneuver over the asteroid to have it inside. Okay. Now, what we have is these cargo locks, right? The way that these work is you need three and they have to all at, at least three but basically three, three is the magic number. They have to be at 90 degrees to each other, which we have worked out and, and figured out. As long as they're all touching something with a 90 degree angle, at least between them, it will hold the thing in place. So what we're gonna have on our rotating system is a cargo lock here on the 45 and this as well. And we also have these two here, right? So at any given time, these two will potentially be touching the asteroid and these two will be on as well. So what's going to happen? And these are mining lasers running at that 45 degree also. So we're creating this cone. I refer to it as a sort of stalactite, I guess, but it's it's more it's less gravity fed, whereas a stalactite holds on tight, you know, um, and that points down due to gravity, right? This is going to point back. And in a way, our gravity feed will be because we have forward propulsion, right? So we have this thing perpetually spinning and we have the mining laser turned on the whole time. Between these sensors, it's holding the mine, the, the, the asteroid still, and it will shave the sides down until it's shaped like a stalactite, right? This is all theory, and who knows if this will ever work, but I might as well float the theory. You know, put my bloody money where my mouth is, and if it all falls over, so be it. Um, so you will actually get to a point where these edges will shave clean off. And because they're in the same rotation and this cargo lock is looking at the same laser line, I suppose, that these, that these uh, mining lasers will be looking at, they will go from reading one to zero if you follow right the laser will shave the edges down to nothing and so now this will see zero so these will start reading zero maybe one will be zero maybe not the other and that will actually release the cargo lock and what's going to happen to the asteroid well he's going to sit kind of stationary for a split second but for all intents and purposes he's going to fall backwards along our ship because our ship will be driving forward as we go to the next asteroid, right? So the idea is shaves down the edges of the asteroid down to zero, cargo lock reads that as zero, releases it back, but then as it just slips back just the tiniest little bit and so the angle uh, widens on the stalactite, right? These will detect these will shave and essentially it will just keep feeding the asteroid further and further back as we slowly, ever so slowly or quickly, I don't know how quick it would be, but the idea is over time it will just shave the asteroid down to nothing and the ore collector will catch everything at the back and we're sitting over the top, our feet dangling down, watching this thing go ballistic, hoping we don't fall out of our seat, looking for the next asteroid. Look, it's all theory, but that's where we're at at the moment. And like I said, my sort of current position, I brought in that frame because it's got a power source and it counts as a 
It counts as a solid frame for me to fasten to, and I'm currently in the process of learning YOLOL, which is the programming chip here. I'll tell you what, if uh, if people don't realize, I'll put this I'll put this in now. See this here, how it says pull down to open? What you do is you click your mouse on it and drag it down. It's an actual like iPhone lock. And we've got some rudimentary script running in there as well. But uh, that actually took me fucking forever to understand that it's, a, it's, it's like a touch. It is a touch screen that behaves like a fucking iPad or something like that. You have to drag it open to, and that's how you write your code. You can also write, write it from in this mode here. You can click on there and you can bring up an actual scripting. Um, where is it? Edit script. So you can bring that up there and start writing it in there. Um, and yeah, and that's sort of where we're at. So look, bit of a theory class there, team. I know I said we were probably going to go do some asteroid hauling or something like that, but this is what I've been up to. Like I said, we've done a, a, a lot of it through stream and, and I do a bit off the channel as well. I hope people found this interesting at the very least. Uh, like I said, I'm no expert. I have a background in, you know, AutoCAD and... Uh, and well, MATLAB's my main programming language, but like, I, I wouldn't say I'm a super duper, you know, I'm very, very basic intermediate at these disciplines. You know, I, I, I didn't really spend a lot of time as a design engineer or anything like that. So my point is, if you're fleetingly familiar with these systems, this, this, is, this stuff should be a cakewalk to pick up. And even if you're a beginner, but you have the passion and your brain works in sort of cogs and engineering sort of types, um, this system is so good. This, to me, this is baby's first, um, pro, uh, first drafts program. Like I, I, I would, I said it on another video, but I would love to see this be something as part of like a high school curriculum. If you're going down that engineering math part to prepare you for the engineering world or an engineering degree or something like that, this, this is so approachable. Um, I know that's not its intent or anything like that, but the developers should be really proud of what they've done, of essentially overlaying a, a GUI over the front of, um, you know, programming language, dra uh, drafting programming. I, I, like, I use AutoCAD as my example, but there's so many things out there anyway. Um, I've had an absolute blast doing this. Um, and yeah, I suppose creativity is the limit. And uh, I don't want to waffle anymore, but that's my sort of design. I'd be curious what people have to say around that. You know, someone might see a huge bloody problem. Uh, again, one one that I'm having a huge problem with. It's not less necessarily that I'm struggling with the programming language. I'm still getting my head around the nuances because it uses like colons and that. It uses some things that I haven't seen before in other languages. Um, I just feel like it might not have the inputs for us to actually maintain a continuous rotation. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Maybe I can come up with a new invention. And maybe, you know, ultimately me showing you this and sharing my work with you, maybe this makes you go, that's a cool idea. I've got a better one. I can do one better. And maybe I help someone along coming up with something interesting and unusual. Um, yeah. Yeah. The cool thing about this, though, is for the most part, it's using most of the systems. Apart from trying to get the turntable to spin, it's not really a programming... Like, I don't have to write 10,000 pages of script, you know? I'm manipulating the existing systems and essentially velocity standing in as a gravity feed um, to to have a, an auto-feed automatic uh, mining machine. So... But like I said, it might not work, but the point is this game makes me think that way. It gets my creative juices flowing and I am so thankful for that. Anyway, team, let me know what you reckon. Let me know if you've got any thoughts on what you'd like to see around this game because it is, it's a strange one to package up into a Let's Play series. I've seen other people like Z1 and all that and he's doing the more traditional stuff. He's going out there and grinding the ore and building bases and that, but I, I'll lie to you. Uh, I won't lie to you, sorry, Jesus. <laughs> I won't lie to you. My appeal is in the design and the mechanics of this game. That is what brings me to it. I feel like if you really did want to just play a space game only to get ore and buy ships, I'm not saying don't get this game, but I'm also saying why are you playing this one and not, say, 
EVE Online or something like that. I suppose, actually, as I say it out loud, I suppose if you were playing from the I'm just going to mine ore and, and fight and, like, never go into the editor, the, all the tools for bolting your ship back together and putting replacement plates and doing, like, battleship, uh, battle zone repairs in the middle of nowhere, that is cool. That is very unusual and nuanced and not something that you really see in a lot of games you know it's be like having a racing game but in an open world but you'd have to get out and do tire changes and you know do like your car mechanic sim but out in the middle of the in the the game as it were anyway i'm waffling at this point i love this game it's a lot of fun it's very difficult for me to turn into a let's play traditionally but if you guys are enjoying this where i'm just doing these sort of planning updates and walking you through some of the systems and that make sure you let me know because that will help inform what i do in the future all right team might just leave it there for the time being and i'll catch you guys on the next one